Hi everyone, I'm Rob Atkinson, the president of ITIF, and I want to welcome you to an event this morning to talk about why the United States needs uh, a national network of manufacturing innovation and also what that network should look like and how it should operate. As most of you know, um, this was a proposal that the Obama administration made last, still this year, we're not in 2008, it made this year. Uh, and as part of that, I've already stood up a pilot program on additive manufacturing at Institute. And uh, in our view, this is, uh, this is the most important thing we can do for manufacturing. Uh, and, and, and if we do it, it would be the most important step Congress has taken since uh, 89, if those of you are old enough to remember, the 89 Omnibus Trade and Competitors Act had a number of important provisions for manufacturing, including uh, renaming NIST and creating the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. So we have a great panel uh, this morning. I'm going to uh, introduce folks. Um, now I'm just going to give a couple minute overview. David Hart, uh, who's the lead author of this report, along with my colleague Stephen Azell. Um, We'll talk a little bit about NNMI, and then we'll hear uh, comments from three uh, potential users of, uh, of such a system. So uh, let me start with, with David. David is a professor at George Mason University. Uh, he's the director of the Center of Sci for Science and Technology uh, and Pub Technology Policy at the School of Public Policy. He uh, has also served most recently as the Assistant Director for Innovation Policy with a focus on advanced manufacturing in uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House uh, and just left that post uh, in August. Uh, David has written numerous uh, art scholarly articles and, and books, including a recent book, uh, MIT Press book, Unlocking Energy Innovation, also the Emergence of Entrepreneurship Policy and Force Consensus Science and Tech Policy and Economic Policy in the United States. Uh, next is uh, Celia Mertzbacher, who is Vice President, Innovative Partnerships for the Semiconductor Research Corporation. For those of you who don't know, one of our most successful industry, university, government partnership, I believe, uh, is the SRC. Um, and um, it is a very interesting model, which I think an NMI, an NMI program can learn from. Prior to joining SRC, uh, Celia was a assistant director of technology R&D in the White House Office of Science and Technology in the Bush administration, where she coordinated and advised on a range of issues, including nanotechnology, IP, and tech transfer. She also oversaw the National Nanotechnology Initiative. Um, prior to that, she was on the staff of the Naval Research Laboratory, and as a research scientist, she developed advanced optical materials in which she uh, was awarded a number of patents. Uh, she also uh, received her PhD in uh, geochemistry and mineralogy from Penn State University. It goes way, way back. That is much better than my PhD. Uh, Denny Dotson, uh, Dennis Dotson is chairman of Dotson Iron Castings. And you may ask, why is a iron <coughs> casting company here? And uh, to my interest and surprise, uh, it turns out that the casting industry is actually the model of innovation. Uh, you think of casting as something that we created uh, you know, 150 years ago. It turns out that there's an enormous amount of innovation happening in that industry right now, and some of it led by, uh, by, by Denny and his firm. Um, this is a, he is a third generation foundryman, uh, and, and, uh, which is a, was created by his grandfather, Dotson Iron <coughs> Casting. Uh, in Mankato, Minnesota. He is also a prime mover for Saugus II, uh, which is a, uh, in itself kind of a model or a proposed model for a kind of NNMI for the, for the casting industry. He is a founding board member of the Metal Casters of Minnesota, and he also is on the board of the American Foundry Society uh, and will be its president in 2013. I should also add uh, that Denny's on the advisory board for the NIST MEP partnership. And uh, finally, um, uh, Steve Betza, who is a corporate engineering director of Lockheed Martin Corporation, where he uh, leads a nationwide process and technology initiatives in electrical engineering. Uh, he uh, has a 30-year career uh, with IBM, L'Oreal, and Lockheed, and he's had a number of responsible, increasingly responsible positions in IT, engineering, and program management. Uh, at Lockheed, he served as engineering director for a 400-person electronics product organization and program director for a business area with 120 million in sales and also CIO for a 
large uh, group of Lockheed Martin companies. Uh, Steve also has uh, Steve has a uh, uh, a degree of bachelor's in science in electrical engineering uh, from Penn State. He was also an award at the Penn State Outstanding Engineering Alumnus in 2002. He's also uh, a member of the American Society for Quality and has advised DOD and the National Security Agency on issues related to microelectronics and the U.S. industrial base. So, uh, a great panel. So let me just jump right in and talk about uh, why we need to do this. So, if you I always remember when we first started working on it in, in, in a serious way on manufacturing, and we had our first event, which was why we need a national manufacturing policy. A colleague walked up to me before the event and he said, why are you guys doing something on manufacturing? I thought you guys were all about innovation. <laughs> and what struck me as, a, as an odd comment, but the more I've talked with people, the more I realize that it, it, it's a very interesting and important comment, because it reflects a pretty widely held view in Washington that manufacturing's that kind of thing. It's this older kind of thing that we don't really need to do because we're superior now. We're, we're knowledge based and uh, this is not really what we do. But really what the right view of manufacturing is, it's, it's, it's making incredibly advanced complex products with knowledge and technology deeply embedded in them, whether it's uh, advanced aeronautics or biotechnology or materials. And these are the kinds of areas where the U.S. Uh, really should lead, and unfortunately we don't as much as we should. Uh, and this has been, I think, one of the major problems for the U.S. economy. And that gets to a key point, which is why is manufacturing important? Well, one reason it's important is because it really drives our ability to have a vibrant traded sector. So if you think about an economy divided into traded sector and non-traded sector, so barbershops, uh, grocery stores, electric utilities, non-traded, manufacturing, software, those kinds of movies, those are going to be traded in global markets. If you cannot be competitive in those traded sectors, your overall economy is going to languish, you're not going to create as many jobs, incomes are not going to go up, uh, and you're going to have economic malaise. Sound familiar? That's exactly why I would argue, and Stephen and Izzel and I argue in our new book. So if you think about that chart, uh, we created, uh, uh, we added about 20% of jobs in the 80s and in the 90s, and in the 2000s, zero. We created no net new jobs. Now, I would argue that that is directly causally related to that orange bar. We lost a third of our manufacturing employment in the 2000s. And because of that, it was a deep and constant drag on job growth and overall economic expansion. And for those of you who hear and read these articles about the great manufacturing renaissance, if anybody's read the Atlantic Monthly story, talking about a uh, nice story by Charles Lane about how GE is bringing back work to their Louisville appliance factory, which uh, is a wonderful story. Uh, there's only one problem with that story. If you look at the overall trade balance in, in household appliances uh, in the last two and a half years, the trade deficit is up 37%. So yes, we have one company bringing back some appliance manufacturing to the U.S., but one company doesn't make the rebound. And so I would argue that we have a severe challenge in the U.S. on manufacturing that we have to respond to. All but one state has lost uh, manufacturing. Uh, that state was Alaska. They went from, I think, three manufacturing jobs to six. Um, <laughs> only kidding. Uh, but you can see the, the breadth of the loss. It used to be that the losses were in the industrial Midwest, uh, but now the South, which is, uh, used to be the manufacturing belt of the U.S., has seen as, as big, if not bigger, declines, uh, as well as states in the West. So, um, let me go back to one, one, one last piece of this. The other reason I think that people miss a lot, uh, and Steve can talk about this much more eloquently than I can, uh, if we do not have a robust uh, manufacturing base, we will not have a robust defense industrial base. And there was a recent GAO report that talked about uh, fraudulent uh, 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 yeah, parts coming into the military, and uh, they're quite significant. Uh, so if we cannot produce the kinds of things our military needs, we're going to be at a defense disadvantage, not just in terms of uh, products that may not work when they get to the battlefield, but our ability to continue to innovate as well as scale up if we really need to do that in a wartime condition. So uh, why do we need a strat Why do we need a policy? Uh, can't we just rely on the market? Isn't the market going to take care of this? 
The market has taken care of this, in part in response to foreign policies from other countries who all have manufacturing policies. They all have aggressive policies to support R&D, to support skill development, uh, to uh, reduce taxes, uh, and increasingly to steal intellectual property to force U.S. manufacturers to move overseas and move that, that IP overseas. Uh, so market forces alone are not going to solve the problem, in part also because a lot of these challenges are when a, when a manufacturer invests in new capital equipment or when they invest in R&D or when they invest in training their workers, they only actually get about half of those benefits. The other half of those benefits essentially spill over, what economists call spillovers. The other half of those benefits go to their competitors and go to their suppliers and go to consumers overall. And so left to themselves, for profit maximizing rational companies will underinvest in these key building blocks. And that's why we have the R&D tax credit. But it's also why we need the specific policies like this. And lastly, as I mentioned, key competitors are already taking action. They have national competitiveness and manufacturing policies, which have proved quite successful. So the next question is, well, we need a manufacturing policy. Why do we need an NNMI? I'm going to turn that over to my colleague David. Thanks, Rob. So, um, if we're on the right slide. Um, so the argument of the paper is that innovation should be at the center of this manu uh, national manufacturing policy. It's not enough by itself, and uh, ITIF has many other reports on other aspects of manufacturing policy, whether it's trade, uh, taxation, uh, regulation. So the argument here is not that innovation is a panacea, but it's a necessary part of any response to the competitive challenge that American manufacturing faces. And uh, the reasons are uh, multiple. Let me just sketch a couple here, and you can read the details in the paper. Uh, there's plenty of labor-intensive, low-skill, um, old-style manufacturing out there in the world, and American workers uh, shouldn't be in competition for that. Uh, we want jobs that are uh, high-skill, that pay well, that produce a lot of value for our economy uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and there should be international trade in manufacturing products. Um, and we should be at the high end of that um, trading process. Uh, second reason is that this is what Americans are good at. We have plenty of institutions that know how to innovate, companies, uh, universities, government laboratories. We have a lot of resources to put into this um, uh, effort. And the challenge is to draw them together. So as Rob mentioned, uh, innovation in manufacturing in particular um, doesn't pay off entirely for the company, although there are things that companies should do and should invest in, and I'm sure we'll hear from our colleagues about that. Uh, but there are other things where all the parties need to get together, um, where academia doesn't provide quite the right incentives, where the market doesn't provide quite the right incentives, and where if government acts alone, it will simply uh, waste its money. So <coughs> NNMI is meant to be an approach that brings together all these partners and produces something of real value uh, for for the manufacturing sector. Um, so what is it? I, I stole a diagram from the AMP report, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership report that the White House put out this summer. Um, I think the best metaphor for any part of the network is a hub. So we're calling uh, the, the nodes of this network uh, institutes for manufacturing innovation. And um, that's the green blob in the middle here. And they are uh, freestanding uh, enterprises that are connected up with small manufacturers, large manufacturers, uh, research institutions, which might be universities, uh, it might be government laboratories, uh, as well as uh, community colleges, uh, organizations that do training of uh, skilled workers, and other kinds of entities as well. So then this next one is my own graphic, so I tried to <coughs> use my limited graphical skills where I just shrunk those hubs down and put them all around the country and I'll link them up. So we have uh, regionally based uh, or industry based hubs that connect up with all the key parties in the manufacturing sector or a manufacturing region, uh, which may serve a number of industries that are linked together by a common process, for instance. And then they're all connected up across the country uh, here. So all I did was shrink that previous slide down and stick it on the map. So that's the extent of my PowerPoint skills. So now you've, now you've seen it all. If you're uh, uh, one of my students, this is, this is the peak of my performance. Um, okay, so 
Um, so we've laid out a set of principles in the document uh, that we think should guide uh, the design. I saw Mike Molnar come in. Mike is the head of the Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office for, uh, for the country. And he's been running a series of workshops as well as a request for information uh, process that is meant to elicit uh, uh, design ideas from uh, lots of stakeholders all around the country. And I know ITIF responded, and many of you may have as well. Um, so this is our take on that, our dis distillation of our views. But um, the key thing here is to start a conversation. We need to have a, first a conversation about this. Then we need to move to action on it. So that's what we're really trying to jumpstart with this, um, uh, with this paper. So five principles for the design, and I'll just uh, run through them uh, individually. So the first one, uh, these uh, institutes uh, for manufacturing innovation should focus on significant industry-defined innovation challenges. So industry-defined is probably the most important term here. Uh, it's industry that ultimately has to use the products of these centers, uh, adopt them into their uh, businesses, and do it quickly uh, because the competition is not waiting, as Rob mentioned. Um, so, um, so it's important for, for industry to generate the ideas that drive these uh, institutes. Um, they need to be focused. They're building a, a set of resources that can be drawn upon for innovation by a sector, by a region, by a group of sectors that are uh, joined together by a common set of challenges. Um, so, um, so there has to be a focus. Uh, so for instance, the Pilot Institute that has been funded uh, in Youngstown is focused on additive manufacturing. There's a list in the document of lots of ideas that came forth in the request for information process um, about <coughs> what focus areas uh, there might be. And then it has to be big enough, big enough to make a difference. So um, the concept of critical mass, I think, is useful in thinking about this. It has to be able to drive the sector forward. Um, there are seats uh, all over here if you want to folks over by the door. just want to come in. There's <coughs> up here about, uh, great, thanks, Rob. So um, we'll come back to the money in a minute. We have a, um, a kind of ballpark idea, roughly 10 times the size of a big university research uh, center. Um, and comparable in scale to uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, which some of you may know about in Germany, would perform this function. There are uh, 60 of these across Germany, so it's a, a two and a half billion euro uh, operation, I think. Um, so that gives us some sense of uh, scale. Uh, okay, so focus on significant uh, industry-defined innovation challenges. That leads to the question of what is innovation, and I think this is probably the most important principle that I would stress, which is that innovation is not just about research. Uh, we have a, a sort of historical division of labor in this country. The public sector supports research, and the private sector does uh, development. And uh, that alone is not an innovation process. Innovation is about making a difference in practice. Um, it does involve those elements, but it may also involve uh, a number of other uh, uh, activities that are listed here, whether it's um, getting the industry together to think about where it's going, uh, technology road mapping, whether it's defining standards, whether it's training workers, all these things are critical to making uh, an innovation that really works in practice. And so we envision these institutes as being hubs for all these activities, not just carrying out research uh, like a university. We don't want to recreate the university system here. And uh, we don't want to be competing with the uh, industry either. And so it needs to have a distinctive space and providing uh, uh, support for innovation uh, uh, activities um, that serve, uh, that serve uh, business but really make a difference uh, in practice. And then the last point here, initial deployment to domestic facilities. I think this is something where we need a little bit more thought. We have some initial ideas. Uh, these institutes need to benefit uh, American production facilities. Uh, but there's no way that you can in this world uh, keep all the knowledge in the United States. So I think we have to imagine this as giving the U.S. lead time and eventually expecting that these ideas will um, spread uh, uh, internationally. But obviously if we're dealing with, especially with small and medium enterprises, you know, those, those enterprises are going to take these up uh, right here, right now, and, and, and in America. Um, third principle, um, we think these institutes should be freestanding. Uh, they are going to involve a lot of partners, and so if the previous principle was the most important one, this one might be the hardest one to actually carry out. How do you actually operate um, an entity that serves a number of different uh, parties, not just big companies, but also small companies um, that are going to be funded by uh, federal government and uh, state agencies? 
<clears throat> um, that are going to involve uh, research universities and community colleges. So there's a lot of players here, and I think the only way that they succeed is if they have their own identity. And that means the partners need to come, uh, uh, get involved, uh, but also authorize this uh, institutes to, to do the work that they need to do. Um, so we uh, describe it as a, a freestanding institution. It might sit for administrative purposes within a university. It might be associated with the university to you know, make sure that the payroll can be done properly. Um, but we imagine it basically being uh, autonomous, having its own board of directors that represents the, uh, the membership um, and especially represents uh, the industry uh, members. So um, we think that industry should be the driving force uh, in setting the agenda, but that needs to be balanced by the other stakeholders in uh, manufacturing uh, innovation. Um, the fourth principle, uh, this should be a bottom-up process. What are the right ideas to fund? Well, I don't know. I don't think uh, anybody in, in this building uh, knows. I don't think the resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue knows. In fact, we have some folks on the panel who might know a little bit more. Um, but the ideas need to come up from, uh, from the bottom. Uh, I heard a couple of presentations last week from uh, senior industry leaders, one from Ford, talking about lightweighting automobiles that are being uh, driven by the, um, uh, the rising mileage standards, and there's a need for tremendous innovation in that industry. That might be one idea. Uh, we heard from GE talking about real-time optimized manufacturing. That is, you now have the potential to put uh, sensors on every machine, every uh, energy and material flow in your factory. Well, in fact, they're doing this, but they have no idea what to do with the data. All the data, they said, goes into a database, and there it sits. So there is an opportunity to take advantage of that. Now, I'm not a manufacturing expert. I don't know if that's the right uh, area. We'll maybe hear some ideas from our panelists here. Um, but the ideas need to come from, uh, from industry, and then I think the government can run a program, as it uh, uh, began to do with the additive uh, pilot, to sort out which are the best ideas. Uh, to draw on uh, expertise uh, across the federal government. There's a lot of manufacturing expertise in the federal government, and DOD, as Rob mentioned, in, uh, in energy, um, uh, in uh, commerce, and uh, particularly in NIST. Uh, we identify NIST as the lead uh, agency for this effort, as it has been so far. Uh, NIST is um, the only part of the federal government that has manufacturing competitiveness or industrial competitiveness as its mission. Uh, it's kind of in its DNA. If you go back to its founding as the Bureau of Standards in 1903, that's what it was founded to do. Um, so while there are a lot of uh, interests in the federal government in manufacturing, and uh, we would like to see other agencies participating in uh, selecting uh, and supporting uh, the institutes, we think this should be uh, in the driver's, uh, driver's seat. And then uh, this program office would also have the responsibility for making sure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So we have uh, the institutes that are the primary uh, movers of this uh, program, but uh, they should be sharing uh, ideas, whether it's about how to run themselves, uh, what the best way to manage intellectual property is. There's going to be ideas that come out of the institutes that can be shared, and the program office would have responsibility for that. All right, so now the part that we've all been waiting for, the money. Um, so uh, I think the biggest uh, concept here is that industry should be uh, uh, invested in these institutes. They're going to have to use uh, the products, as I mentioned. It's important that they uh, bring their best ideas and um, in many cases actually bringing people to these institutes so that the transfer of ideas is smooth between what's generated uh, by the institutes and uh, what happens in the factory. Um, and I think the way to get that engagement is to have investment. Um, so we propose that 50% uh, of the uh, institute cost be funded by industry, and this is going to you know, vary from institute to institute and from industry to industry exactly how that's composed. Some of that might be in-kind resources where they share people or share equipment or share uh, facilities. Um, some of it, uh, that second bullet should actually be indented a little bit. Uh, some of it might be for specific projects, um, uh, and some of it should be for uh, supporting the institution as a whole. Uh, the federal government has a role to play here. Um, we've been debating amongst ourselves as to whether it should be uh, an ongoing role, as it uh, is in Germany with the Fraunhofer's. The federal and state governments both play ongoing role in funding those institutes, or whether it's possible for these institutes to make their way to a sort of uh, self-sustaining uh, mode. Um, 
but we suggest in any case that the federal investment probably be front loaded, right, to build it up, uh, create the facilities, and um, and then industry uh, support should pick up uh, over time. Uh, it's really important for the states to be involved in these uh, institutes. Um, many of the benefits will benefit particular regions, although I think the institutes as a whole should serve the nation. Um, and the states have shown a very lively interest in manufacturing. If Rob gave his longer talk, he could go into great depth as to the governor's interest in this. Um, and as that map suggested, I think they should be uh, all around the country because we have different strengths all over the country, in particular manufacturing uh, sectors. Um, and we think that it's possible that the state contribution could grow to uh, support the role of small and medium-sized enterprises to participate in these uh, institutes. They might also pick up some revenue from some other sources as they get going, whether it's contract research, whether it's IT licensing. Um, and then we throw out a ballpark figure. Um, again, we sort of estimated that each one of the institutes should be, say, 30 to $50 million per year in, in turnover. So as I said, roughly an order of magnitude larger than a, uh, for instance, an engineering research center, which is something that the National Science Foundation funds at uh, universities. Um, and uh, there's really no uh, uh, science behind the, the idea that there should be uh, 15, as the administration has suggested, or 25, as we suggest. It really depends on what industry is willing to support and um, what their demand is for them. So um, this is just a, a sort of ballpark idea uh, to get the conversation rolling. We haven't proposed a specific funding source. I think we'll leave that to Capitol Hill to figure out. Um, but that's obviously going to be a large challenge. I would say that it's really important to make this investment even in a time of uh, tight budgets. Uh, it's a, something that's going to pay off down the road. And um, uh, so even, you know, even given the constraints that we're going to uh, be under, I think it's a very worthwhile uh, a new start. Um, so wrap up. So here's our five points. Number one, we have a, we have a manufacturing problem. Rob has articulated that. Um, one, of the part, one of the solutions is going to be innovation, as I said, I think a necessary, if not sufficient, part of it. Differentiate our manufacturing from our competitors and um, provide for high-scale, high-wage jobs. Uh, the rest of the world isn't waiting for us. We see uh, countries like Korea, like Germany, um, and uh, even in the developing world, taking action not just at uh, labor-intensive, low-scale manufacturing, but, but targeting medium- and high-scale manufacturing. Um, innovation problem is not going to be solved by the market alone, although the market is an important player here. Um, and uh, uh, we're not talking about um, uh, disrupting the market, we're talking about supplementing and making it stronger. Um, and then we have a set of uh, specific ideas about the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, which we hope that Congress will start uh, talking about in the coming year. And with that, I will turn it over to some of our uh, industry colleagues to share their perspectives on this. Thank you, Dave. Should we? Okay. Good slides. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. And uh, congratulations to David and Stephen for a great report. I think it's really helping to start the conversation that, that David uh, referred to. Um, I'm here as sort of the representative of the consortium world. And um, as Rob mentioned, the semiconductor industry has been using consortia to stimulate its own innovation for a long time. So I thought I would spend my time, and let's see, I think I have about 10 minutes, um, telling you a little bit about the semiconductor industry and its consortia. Some of you know them, but um, often I say I'm with SRC, and people say, oh, are you with Semitech? No, I'm with SRC. So there are multiple consortia, and I'll explain them a little bit. And then I'll offer a few thoughts and lessons learned that might benefit um, the NNMI to make it successful. The semiconductor industry, uh, just to give you sort of a, an appreciation for what this industry is to the U.S. and to the world, it's about a $300 billion industry annually, and um, a significant part of that is uh, owned by the U.S. industry, which are global companies, of course. Uh, almost half of the market is served by U.S. companies. In the U.S., there are about 250,000 direct jobs in the U.S. semiconductor industry and over a million indirect jobs supported by that industry. And they are uh, well-paying jobs in general. There's uh, a salary of over $120,000 a year loaded um, compared to around $48,000 uh, for the average worker in the U.S. 
Um, so it's an important industry, and it's also important as an exporter. It is, if you look back over the past decade, the number one exporting industry in the U.S. And um, it's extremely competitive. There are um, a lot of wars in the marketplace, if you will, but nevertheless, these companies have come together and worked together in consortia to uh, benefit themselves and to make themselves competitive. So um, there are a number of essential features of the consortial aspects of the semiconductor industry that I'd like to talk about. And SRC, which has been around for 30 years, was created because the industry did not see a sufficient pipeline of ideas and investment at the basic research level. So SRC was formed to fund university research, and that's what we do. We have uh, now international membership. We were originally a US-only um, member organization. And we fund university research today worldwide as well, although predominantly in the US. And the value that we provide to the members is access to the results of that research in sort of real time and uh, access to the people, both the faculty, researchers, and the students. And when I ask our members, why are you a member of SRC, half the time they say because of the students and half the time they say because of the idea. So they both go together. We wouldn't have the great research without the good students and we wouldn't have the good students without funding the great research. So this is a model that's worked exceedingly well. It's created an enterprise in the university community of researchers who are working on relevant research and thereby producing students and the future workforce. Semitech, on the other hand, is a physical place. It's a bricks and mortar um, institution that uh, has employees and is focused on nearer term problems and is really addressing manufacturability. How do we take the ideas from the universities and make them manufacturable? And so Semitech has many of the same member companies as SRC, of course. It also has become a global organization. And, uh, but it is focused on nearer term problems. Um, so there are some similarities and some differences. Um, there are some aspects of all of this that may or may not be unique. Some people think they are, I'm not sure they are. You can generalize them perhaps. But these consortia are driven by industry, number one, and I think that's an important point in the paper that um, came out today. The, the institutes, I think, will really survive and succeed if they are industry driven. Um, and they need to be focused on an agreed upon goal. The consensus in the semiconductor industry for many, many years has been, we need to stay on Moore's law. The miniaturization of integrated circuits that allows the industry to produce products that are smaller, faster, cheaper, more functional, is driven by this scaling. And that involves all of the different pieces of the supply chain, the people who make the equipment have to be making equipment that can make things smaller. And all of that has brought the industry together to work and make sure that they're able to stay on that law. It's, it's not a law of physics, of course, it's essentially a law of business, but it's really been viewed as critical to the success of all of the parts of the industry. So, um, what are some of the lessons that have been learned from the semiconductor industry's experience? Well, one is this idea that the consortium needs to be industry-driven and goal-oriented. I think another piece that's very important is in the case of both SRC and Semitech, there is an independent third-party operation that manages the consortium. It's not within any of the members. It doesn't rotate around. We have a board that's made up of our member companies, but we are an independent third-party entity. And we are able to manage the relationships between the members. And we also are at the interface between the members, i.e. the industry, and the performers of the research, in our case, the universities. And that's an important thing. There are a lot of collaborations that result from these relationships that come about. But we don't require that there be side-by-side -side, uh, collaboration between industry and university researchers. And in fact, there's a bit of a gap that we are in. And that helps, in fact, with IP issues in many cases and so on. So we're the broker that's, or the glue, if you want, between all of these organizations. We partner with government um, in ways that make sense for the industry. These members are voluntary members. They will not stay in the club if there's no value. So 
that's another sort of lesson learned. You must provide value through these institutes to the participants, or they will not remain in it and won't continue to sustain it. Um, okay. And uh, I just sort of made a, a list that I wanted to wrap up with and ended up being the three Ps. So um, I'll focus on those just for a couple minutes. Um, one thing that isn't emphasized in the report here, uh, but I think it's implied, and that is, it, in some ways, it's about the people. It's about bringing people together from the different stakeholder groups, because that's how ideas flow. It's about educating students, it's about training workers, it's about getting the industry people explaining to the other parts of the uh, institute and the other stakeholders what they need so that those needs can be addressed. Everybody gets up in the morning wanting to help, in a sense, uh, but you have to have the connections between the people for that to happen. So it's going to be between industry and industry, university and industry, government, university and industry. I really see these institutes as bringing together people. The second P is partnership, and that was a word that David used as well. It can't be a supplier-vendor kind of relationship between the government and the industry. These need to be partnerships, and that's another reason for having this independent place where the uh, institutes are managed and run. And the third P is patience. I know we've started a pilot institute, and everybody hopes there's some immediate results and benefit. But uh, our experience in the semiconductor industry that it does take time and you need to be patient and these kinds, the, the, many of the outputs and outcomes will take many years, especially when you're involving uh, people and moving people and training people and educating people. So, people, partnership, and patience. Before you stop, can you just also talk about the financial funding model for SRC? Okay, glad to. And uh, I do want to mention that Semitech was uh, started in, I think it was 1987, it was co-funded 50-50 between industry and government, and that was a 10-year partnership in funding, and it was $100 million a year from government and from industry. So to the size matters uh, comment, um, it does need to make a difference. It needs to be a substantial amount. And in that case, because you're talking bricks and mortar, and in these cases, I think you may be too, that's, that's part of the reason. Um, SRC's funding model is... Uh, uh, there are several actually. Our core funding model was based on essentially a metric of the size of the company, so a sort of small percent of a very big number goes to SRC, and that's how our core program operates, with a cap on the membership fee, thereby um, making sure that no one company becomes the big gorilla in a sense. And we have a couple of members who are capped. Um, I can tell you our cap is actually $7.5 million per year, so that's a substantial membership fee. Uh, some companies are capped and a number are not. Other of our programs, and we have a number of different legally distinct programs under our SRC umbrella today, are flat fee models. Um, so there's flexibility in the private sector for doing things that make sense for different programs. But um, they each require the members to con contribute a significant amount, uh, and there's that skin in the game is very important. They pay attention when they have skin in the game. We do, we have a program, in fact, it's still, it's just been renewed, um, that is co-funded with DARPA. Our, we have programs that have sort of different time horizons, and then one of the nearest time horizon, our core program, is predominantly industry funded. We have a longer term program, which is jointly funded 50-50 with DARPA. And then we have the Nano Electronics Research Initiative, which is even longer term, and um, is in some ways a good model, perhaps, for some of these institutes, because it has some state monies, it's uh, a number of centers that are geographically distributed, so each of the centers has been successful in getting some state support um, and has a, a smaller number of member companies that are very like-minded, and uh, it's been a very sort of um, positive uh, experience for them because it is so long-term. And I think that's another lesson that SRC has learned is it's easier to get agreement and consensus on these very long-term needs there's less competitiveness and, and more agreement in general. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's real easy for me to stand before you and be an advocate for the National, National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. Uh, just look at how quickly the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute is coming together and the real expectations that exist for that uh, industry. 
And there are any number of exciting and sexy areas where moving the TRL or MRL from, from two to seven will capture the imagination and the money to accomplish great things. I suggest, however, that years from now, one of the biggest benefits of the NNMI will be the impact made on existing mature industries and on small business manufacturing firms. I'm a representative of this declining group, a small business manufacturing firm with 150 employees. Specifically, I own an iron foundry that has been in operation since 1876. When my grandfather started working at this foundry in 1923, there were 20,000 iron foundries in the U.S. When my father started, there were 6,000. When I started my manufacturing career in 1972, uh, there were 2,000. And today, the number of iron foundries is about 400, so declining. Uh, when you add all the foundries together, the aluminum, brass, bronze, uh, uh, steel foundries, there's just over 200,000, or 2,000. 2, and the employment in the industry is about 200,000, and the value added is about 30 billion in this industry. Uh, yet it's an important part of the industry because nothing moves without a casting. It is one of the building blocks that exists. Uh, Rob talked about uh, the industry, uh, and it's, it is a mature industry. In fact, uh, the first manufacturing plant in the uh, new world. In 1642, uh, the Saugus Iron Works was a foundry, and uh, so we are a mature industry. Small foundries, like many of the small manufacturing uh, companies, have the image of all the D words. Uh, dark, dangerous, depressing, decaying, declining, and go on dirty, and performance that is disappointing. Uh, I wish that I could say that the perception is wrong, but the reality is that most foundries deserve to be identified with these D words. There are firms within my industry, and certainly there are many manufacturing firms in the U.S. that are setting world-class standards. In the past few years, I've visited more than 50 manufacturing innovation firms around the world, and I'm absolutely blown away by the innovative approach that big and small companies are using to solve challenges. But it isn't happening here in the mature industries. For the foundry industry, there are really three types of company. First, there are these big multi-plant groups that are owned by venture firms that are primarily interested in flipping these companies. There certainly isn't much innovation or recapitalization that is taking place at these firms. The second group is the, the huge part of our industry, which is 80% of the 2,000 foundries and they are small businesses with less than 100 employees. And they have only one goal, and that's to stay, stay alive. They, they are out there, they're working in their business, and there's very little innovation that's taking place there. And finally, there's a small group of companies that are large enough to recapitalize their plants with the best equipment in the world. What the NM, NNMI will do, and specifically what an institute for manufacturing innovation focused on mature industries will do, is to bring the best of already established technology, technologies, equipment, processes, and people to companies that have stopped innovating 30 years ago. You can argue the reason for this decline in productivity in these industries, it could be regulations, world competition, economic cycles, <coughs> poor management, unions, employee skills, but the reality is that our manufacturing infrastructure is aging and no longer meets our customers' needs. Our company is successful today because of a lot of good people. We are also successful because of two government programs. In 1981, uh, there was a recession. I don't see enough gray hair for here to have people that lived through that recession. Uh, but in the manufacturing area, it was defined as a rough rust bowl. We lost 80% of our uh, sales during that time period. And we had really no, no reason, uh, economic reason, to stay in business. But at the very worst of all those times, we did receive a small business administration loan, and that kept us going and uh, allowed us to continue and reinvent our business. The second government program 
that has defined our company is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. It was Enterprise Minnesota, a NIST MEP affiliate, which provided the catalyst to move us aggressively on our lean journey. The impact on a 137-year-old company is amazing. Eight years ago, these were the numbers for our foundry, and they were very typical of others in the industry. Our on-time delivery was at 85%. The work and process inventory that we had in our plant was 30 days of production. The finished goods inventory that existed was another 30 days. 2.2% of our product was returned from our customers as being not acceptable. And lead time was eight weeks. Definitely the D word for performance that is disappointing. Today, it's dramatically different. On-time delivery is 99.5%. Work in process is 18 hours, not 30 days. Uh, finished goods are at three days. Returns are now less than 0.2%, and that includes paperwork errors. And lead time is at two weeks. We are also adding value to our customers with a new in-house machining operation a paint line and we'll soon be adding a complex heat treating operation. Uh, perhaps we need to define a new D word for performance and that would be delightful. Uh, our customers are certainly pleased with that performance. My point is that this can be done in a mature industry but it needs an outside push. My concern <coughs> is that the small successes in modernizing old plants are not happening fast enough to take advantage of the current reshoring opportunities. Yeah. A senior supply chain manager at Caterpillar made this comment. Industry has a unique opportunity to win back a lot of business that left to chase lower costs in years past. But they have to do it with superior customer service quality delivery and world-class total costs. The message is that we will not be satisfied with the status quo. The John Deere manager said, we are also concerned with the continued lack of interest from many founders in the U.S. who continue to resist adding operations and services uh, for their customers, sticking only to providing raw castings and not fully machined castings and paint. This is more broadly available and the accepted practice in other parts of the world, giving overseas foundries a competitive supply chain advantage. A Komatsu America exec said, we are developing additional offshore suppliers due to the failure of domestic foundries in maintaining technology and keeping pace with the market needs and capacity requirements. It is my opinion that the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation is a critical element in the manufacturing renaissance that needs to take place in the U.S. The original equipment manufacturers have expressed a desire and a real need to source components close to final assembly plants. If we cannot significantly improve the capabilities and performances of the manufacturing infrastructure, we will lose our last best chance to keep manufacturing as a driving force in the economy. My final double D word is don't delay. Uh, fund and in, um, implement the uh, NMI. Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And, as cited in the report released this morning, Lockheed Martin believes that a national network for manufacturing innovation is not just the right initiative, it's the right initiative at the right time. There are four profound benefits that we see from this initiative. First benefit, I will call accelerated best practice sharing. The institutes that will be stood up in this national network are, will be uniquely positioned to be able to foster collaboration and share best practices in a way that is very challenging for either universities or uh, members of industry. And the reason, is, as, as Denny referenced, is it's really the what we call the technology readiness level or the manufacturing readiness level where you spend most of your time. Universities are largely focused on basic research 
and, and then trend in the applied research space. Industry is largely focused on full-scale production with limited visibility on the basic research that's occurring. The connections and the innovation connections that the institutes will make will be what will foster best practice sharing in an accelerated way that is very much needed. Second benefit is not just innovation in manufacturing, <coughs> but it's innovation in the front end process of design. We are rapidly exiting the era, era when manufacturing is the follower to a design team that is conceiving a product. What we're now seeing is with new materials, with composite materials, with additive manufacturing processes, we're seeing the manufacturing sector and manufacturing teams open up new possibilities to the front end design community to what new products can look like. That is a very healthy transition. In fact, that's one where the dream of what we would call concurrent engineering, where all disciplines are involved at the beginning of a program and continue to the end, now can be made a reality by the fact that uh, both manufacturing and the design sectors are equal partners in innovation. The third benefit is properly chartered. We believe each manufacturing institute will be a catalyst for STEM education and for capturing the hearts and minds of K through 12 students, university students, uh, and also early career professionals to pursue careers in manufacturing. I have several young members on my team at Lockheed Martin who've joined and their passion now is to get involved in the additive manufacturing movement as to how they would want to pursue their careers as engineering professionals. <coughs> the corollary to this in the third benefit is workforce development of established professionals. What an opportunity these institutes will provide if we can do an inreach into community colleges, if we can do an inreach for job creation, and what the skills that are now required in the 21st century of a manufacturing worker in today's workplace where rote hand assembly is long a thing of the past and, and familiarity with automation and tooling and advanced methods is the education of the future. The fourth benefit, as, as was referenced in the opening statement, is the U.S. industrial base and national security. When I started in the aerospace industry 30 years ago, there were over 3,000 printed circuit board manufacturers in the United States of America. I spoke at a conference with the IPC over a year ago where we, we took score. There are less than 300 of those same printed circuit board manufacturers in the United States today. And if you look in the aerospace <coughs> and defense industry, probably 10 to 15 of those uh, companies actually can provide the complexity or the high reliability that we need to serve our nation uh, and defend our nation properly. Similarly, onshore presence of whether it's electronics manufacturing, machining, or the like is absolutely vital as we perform our role. If you think of the export regulations that we work with in terms of protecting designs before we, uh, in the national interest, and then ultimately shipping a quality product to the Department of Defense or the uh, three-letter agencies we serve. So, as the national network is formed, we would encourage all companies, large and small. We would encourage all academic institutions that are focused on science and engineering to look for opportunities to participate and connect. We've proven that we can do great things as a nation when we reach high and when we come together to shape the future. This is a reach high initiative. And so in closing, we warmly congratulate the authors and the ITF on the release of this report, and we look forward to the adoption of its recommendations. Thank you very much. Right, well, great. Thank you so much, um, all three of our, our commentators. Um, before I open it up for questions or comments from the audience, I just want to ask any of the panelists or David, if there are any responses in response to what you've heard, if you want to add anything now, or also just open it up. Okay, good. Uh, why don't we, uh, if, if you can identify yourself, and then uh, sure. Richard. Uh, Richard McCormack, I'm editor of Manufacturing and Technology News. I covered the formation of Semitech. Bob Noyce, who was the inventor of the integrated circuit, came to Washington constantly and became president of Semitech. 
is there any industry initiative to make sure that this gets funded uh, through Congress? He worked like mad to do that. He came, became president of Semitech. Any anything from the industry to get this thing through Congress? Bob invented Intel. By the way, before that, is <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You sort of, well, I think you put your finger on something, which is that this is not a semiconductor manufacturing initiative or a, a metal industry or materials, and and that may be an issue. I, I do see challenges to this initiative in trying to cover all bases in a sense. So it needs um, it needs a lot of support from different places, I guess, and <coughs> building a team of a handful of industries, and there's clearly interest based on the response to the RFI, and uh, so maybe identifying from that group, and there, there's also the, uh, David, you know, the Manufacturing Partnership Team, so there is yeah. already some assembly of support, maybe those are the organizations where it will come from. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to mention, so we have the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee, which was a dozen companies and six uh, university presidents, and I think that's the nucleus, but I think it needs to be built up needs to be developed and um, it's going to take uh, it's going to take that uh, industry a voice to make it happen so uh, I think that's that's work that has to be done now you need to have more than a dozen companies respond to the RFI that was led by the National Program Office I, I think it is going to be harder to get that high level uh, CEO support and that's just not what CEOs generally do these days you know you have a few exceptions here and there which is, is, is really good laudable but um, I think it's a mistake if we if we wait for uh, that kind of leadership and, and, you know, I think there's broad support uh, by industry I think we've seen that both on this panel as well as uh, in, in the submissions um, and I think that's pretty, that, that's pretty real um, but I think Congress uh, so ultimately just has to say that and say, you know there's support there this is something industry needs and industry wants and we just have to do it other comments or questions I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent can the uh, internet be used to get together the meetings of everybody who's involved in this and get their contributions to the process? <coughs> um, well, I think, you know, I think some of these uh, institutes might have the virtual aspects. I mean, I can imagine some of them, uh, depending on what the problem is, uh, operating in that mode. I think many of them will have physical facilities and um, you know a, a, a strong geographical presence so I think it may vary from uh, from problem to problem uh, but certainly there's a need to take advantage of the infrastructure in, you know information infrastructure and and use it to um, uh, to to economize on costs and uh, I do think that you know, the IT is 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 penetrating into manufacturing in a big way and so increasingly and I think some of the breakthroughs that Steve was alluding to uh, you know, have their roots in that in that capability. Um, so I think there will be opportunities to use that. I'd, I'd like to add to that. I think I think in addition to what we would think of as the World Wide Web in terms of access, we cannot discount the role of what social media can play. And, and I will use one example in terms of Twitter as a as a technology that can disseminate information. Some of you, us in this room, if we're not on Twitter, sometimes think of it as being a casual uh, uh, conversational yeah, yeah, uh, forum. I personally subscribe to 120 different Twitter feeds each day that keep me in touch with uh, advancements in manufacturing, advancements in the electronics industry, and it is one, a great way for any new institute to be able to do news releases, uh, publicize reports, and, uh, and also uh, connect the community. And so. Uh, that would be an encouraging thing we would offer to uh, look to the web, but also look in addition to the web for channels that would uh, reach out. You know, I'll um, just mention that um, our, having been around for 30 years, SRC, just yesterday, our CEO was recalling that we used to share the results of our work through paper. We killed a lot of trees, sent out reports to all of our members, and then we went to a CD, and apparently he used to send out 10,000 CDs regularly to the engineers at our member company so that they would have copies of the results. Of course, now it's all available on our website, 
And not only that, but I think to one of the benefits that you are alluding to, we have regular e-seminars and e-workshops where hundreds of people will be listening in, you know, as I said, real time to the results of a researcher reporting to the member companies. So um, these tools, I think, can really help uh, in the case of distributed organizations very effectively. David's point about the uh, Twitter, we think of Twitter as people talking back and forth or disseminating ends of it. But to me, the exciting uh, aspect of that infrastructure is in a manufacturing plant, it's machines reporting on their states and the whole structure is there, it exists. So all of a sudden this, this piece of equipment is down, it tweets out to whoever wants to follow on that piece of equipment that it's down for this reason. So it, it, it really is an explosive uh, uh, opportunity that exists there. I actually have a CNC machine in Michigan that follows me. <laughs> <laughs> with Fred Solier Polytechnic Institute. I was sort of wondering in working on the ITIF report, if you thought about time scale, because what I see sort of playing out possibly, if, if we get enough congressional support and this gets launched, that it becomes something similar to what happened with the hubs at the Department of Energy, that maybe they only fund one a year or some, something like that. And I'm wondering if it's useful this uh, dilutes it all if you're looking at 10 years to reach uh, 15 or, or 25 centers? Well, um, I guess I would say, yeah, the more we can do, the quicker, the better. Uh, you know, I, I suppose that's a common refrain uh, in this building. Um, but I do think there, I guess I would say the most important thing is sort of the, to, to do big individual institutes. I would hate to see them diluted into you know, take the 40 million and spread it across 10. So I would rather have fewer, bigger ones, um, but obviously I'd rather have, you know, more of those. So that's my, my thought on, uh, on that particular question. And I just add to that, uh, you know, if you compare this to say something like getting um, uh, e-health, you know, transformed in the U.S., uh, where we're making some progress, but not, not as much as we should, um, you know, the reality is if we don't do it, the impact will be that our doctors don't go out of business and move to India. And it just means that we just don't have as good a health care system, which is a problem. But, you know, it, it, eventually you can still do it. I think we don't have a lot of time in manufacturing. I think we've got about another decade. And after that, we reach the, what we would call in our book the British tipping point, uh, <laughs> where uh, you get to a tipping point that the UK had, and you're very, very hard pressed to. to to recreate this. So if we were to lose some of the advanced capabilities that Lockheed has or that Boeing has or that Intel has, very, very difficult to ever get those back. And uh, the only way to get them back is by massive, massive government subsidies, which is inappropriate and not what we should do. So I think we don't have a lot of time, and if we don't do this now, along with other changes on the regulatory side, on the skill side, on the tax side, uh, we could reach that to be uh, Yes, sir. Hi, um, Andrew Starwell from Senator Brown's office. I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment is uh, piggybacking on the first question, actually. Um, I think it's important for private industry uh, to have a prominent voice uh, in this, not just to get it funded, uh, but so that if it does get funded, uh, it really is a industry-driven uh, effort in my experience, universities tend to uh, be more proactive in staking out ground in these types of activities. So that's just my comment. Uh, my question is, you touched on it briefly. Um, how do you see IP issues playing out? Not just within the uh, regional hubs, but uh, network, or sorry, institute to institute. Um, so for instance, you had the magnificent map that you made, um, you have solid black lines. You know, are those just symbolic, or is there real uh, intellectual value going from institute to institute? So, I mean, I think with respect to the intellectual property as a legal phenomenon, I think that's going to vary. I mean, uh, we see industries having wide, you know, variation in how they use those tools, and I think it's going to be a naughty issue. I mean, I think we see it at the Advent Institute already. It's going to be hard to work out, and it's going to have to be worked out by the members, you know, um, 
from, from institute to institute. Now, there may be some learning that goes on as to how to manage that process, but I think it's going to have to vary. Uh, I don't know whether intellectual property will flow from institute to institute, but you know, there may be have some that are linked together. Uh, but I see those you know, being more um, you know, idea sharing. Or, I, I guess I see the intellectual property is going to flow from the institute into the, into the user. You know, that's, the, that's, the, that's the link that I'm more concerned about. So how does a, a company like Denny's or, or like Steve's you know, actually take something of value from, um, from the institute? And, and I think that that's, that's going to be a challenge. There's no question about it. Ready? From a small business standpoint, it, it really existing small businesses, it may not be the patented IP that's important. Uh, when we talk about the TRLs going from two to seven, and usually what a TRL is, oh, uh, technical uh, readiness level, uh, uh, and it's the same end of it in the manufacturing readiness level. Uh, I believe that taking existing best of from one industry and applying it to an industry that's not using those best of technologies. And, and there's no IP problem with any of that. It's all established, but it's absolutely new technology for the thousands and thousands and thousands of existing small businesses. So uh, yes, I agree that there is an IP problem uh, that exists in the patent world, and that all has to get shared. But uh, again, from an existing manufacturing standpoint, it really is bringing the technologies that already exist, the people, the processes, down to the uh, uh, small business, small medium enterprises that are out there. And that was, thank you for that great question, because I think there is two practical ways that this can be attacked. One is that uh, there are proprietary exchange agreements that we commonly put in place with either universities or other entities that allow the sharing of proprietary data amongst us when we're doing joint exploration. So those are one key elements that we want to have an institute be involved in brokering. But another is uh, universities, for instance, re realize the importance of industry-funded research as part of what they do. And an increasing number are showing willingness to do, let's call a master agreement with institutions where you strike a master agreement, even though it may not be easy, you work out the IP issues and then once you've got that done, you can just go from task order to task order to be able to sponsor work. And so those can be uh, two frameworks that help uh, address that so that each and every time we're not faced with some IP issue that would come through, come through an institute. And I can just say that in SRC's experience, there was um, early on a lot of contentious discussion. Again, we were negotiating with universities. It was right after my dole had passed. There was a lot of confusion, I think, and learning going on. Um, we had a team come together with leadership from the academic community and from the industry and say, here's what I care about, here's you know what I care about, and let's agree upon what our sort of minimum basic IP terms are going to be, and those are the ones we use to this day. So I think up front is important to have those conversations, get what you need, and don't worry about getting you know everything you want, perhaps to make it go forward. And again, the longer term the horizon, I think the easier it's going to be. Yes, sir. I'm going to say starting with the uh, Just a quick question. Of course, these are long-term investments. And of course, right now, there's a request for a billion dollars for support of the program. How long do you believe, does this panel believe is, uh, that support will continue to be required to uh, keep the IMI, individual IMIs going? Or how long should it take or should be expected to put down guys become self-supporting. Well, Rob and I are having an ongoing conversation about this. <coughs> I, I think um, I think we you said ten years for Semitech. So I mean think something on that horizon. But there may be some virtue in having a continuing public role from the point of view of making the institutes function. There's a danger, I think, that they'll get pulled to do you know, very short term things. So you know if it could be set up such that there's a, an ongoing stream, and we do see this in other countries, that that's the model that, that they've generally adopted. Um, you know, I would love to see them uh, operate perfectly in a long-term context uh, supported by non-governmental sources, but there may be some sectors where that's just not realistic. I guess the question is, how long do we fund universities for? The answer is in perpetuity, we hope, because they're doing work that is inherently 
uh, and has large, large externalities and, and spillovers. And there is a, even with this, you know, I, I think David's right, that in the ideal world you want to just make more and more of this, but there's still a core part of that work that's just stuff that industry just doesn't want to fund or it's too far out. And without that, the, 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 the institutes will tend to focus shorter term. And I think we don't want that. We, we don't want that only, I should say. We, we, want, we want a mix of a, a range of time horizon work in an institute. Good example of that is a really great institute in Ohio, uh, in Columbus, called, used to be called the Edison Welding Institute, now called EWI. EWI does wonderful, uh, very interesting work on, on metal joining and metal cutting. Um, which again, you wouldn't think there's much innovation, there's an enormous amount of innovation that they're doing for the Army and the military and other, other branches. Um, but one of their challenges is that the projects they tend to get, that they can get money for, tend to be relatively narrow uh, in time horizon. And they're fascinating work that's four to five years out, it's harder for them to do, and, but critical for us to do and be able to do as a country. Uh, particularly in the case of the military, we want them to have the best ability to have a, a uh, you know, uh, uh, troop carriers that can avoid explode or can deal with explosive devices, things like that. So, uh, yes, uh, Maggie Lloyd, MIT Washington office. Uh, what metrics are being used to track the progress of the Youngstown pilot, and who is tracking them? Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that. Is, is Mike here? Uh, anybody from NIST here who wants to comment on that? I want to put it in the spot, but sure. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's an interagency team that is. Uh, Can you identify is, yourself, please? Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Muller with the Department of Commerce. It's an interagency team that's uh, that's supporting NAMI. If you go to the NAMI website, NAMI.org, you can see the current members. It, it continues to it, uh, dramatically expand. But uh, the, the criticism is we have, in fact, too many metrics, and they've focused and identified on their critical metrics. Uh, but uh, I, I would point to the one. It's emerging now, which is there. Uh, in, in the coming month, they will be chartering uh, their first rounds of projects. So the the, the uh, chartering and issuing of projects is uh, is an important metric. Who's participating and how are they participating is another uh, uh, API. But if you go to the uh, NAMI website, you can see what their list of KPIs are. I would add to that that in any initiative like this, if there's an importance to have a balance of what, what we could call pre-process, in-process, and end-process measures, because early in the life of an institute, you're going to be wanting to measure are all the right collaborations occurring that are going to allow projects and ideas to be born. In the middle, you're going to want to be tracking their progression, and then you're only going to be able to report on success from a measurement standpoint. So that balanced scorecard that Mike was referring to in the back, I think, is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, also, just, uh, I don't know if David and I agree on this one or not, but uh, <laughs> it's amazing we can even write this report to it. My own view is that the most important metric is you have industry money. You know, if industry's putting money into this thing, it means they're getting something of value. Not the only metric, but it's really the most important one. If, if they're Walking away without you know without you know walk, taking their money out, then you know there's a problem and it's not performing. If they're if they're putting their money in, you know it's something going that's working pretty well. And it's again not the only metric, but I think the most central. Sure, I'm Kate with Northeast Midwest Congressional Coalition. We're glad to be a coordinating host of this event along with the House Manufacturing Caucus. And I wanted to see if you could speak a little bit more about the interface with this with the MEP program. I know it's spoken about a little bit, especially about how this might help amplify the MEP program. But just want to see some more reactions on, on that sort of interaction. Yeah, I see them. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm going to say, why don't we start with Denny? Sure. Because he's, that's the thing yeah. we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, I think from day one, uh, this institute has uh, looked at the MEP program as being an important connector to the small business uh, manufacturers. That is the network that's out there. They are the people that understand what it is to walk into a 100 employee plant and to uh, take them from this level to this level. It's precisely what they did in our plant. If we can do that in more and more and faster, uh, that will be the impact. But I think every single one of the institutes uh, uh, will have a major uh, component of the uh, uh, MEPs that are in that area. And 
the MEPs, uh, what is exciting to me about the MEPs is that there's 60 of them out there and they are all different models and they will evolve uh, around these uh, IMIs uh, and, and find the niche that they can connect into the small business, uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. No, you said it better than I would, so thank you. I would just add, I think the model in part is in the agricultural uh, system where we have ag extensions programs in every state and we also have um, well, uh, what used to be well-funded, not anymore, well-funded agricultural research institutes uh, that the government supports. And historically, those institutes, one of the vehicles by which you got that, uh, those innovations and that knowledge transferred out to actual farmers or ranchers uh, was through uh, the uh, was the ag extension. I think that could be a, a model of how, uh, that, that's one model, one uh, role that the MEP would be playing. MEP's kind of thing. The trend <clears throat> Mark. Yeah, hey, uh, Mark Nero with uh, Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. Uh, really interested in parallels, uh, learnings, and similarities to the energy hubs, uh, you know, startup that, that, you know, as one person mentioned, has in some ways troubled, in some ways offers uh, you know, a, a, a parallel vision in some ways. So it's always being implemented by DOE, maybe in ways that don't that foreclose on some of the uh, network benefits uh, and bottom-up feel of NMMI. I wonder if you guys are looking at that. So, I mean, in some I think ways, the I think there's value in pushing them together. Some they're definitely not industry led. Yeah, that's a problem, right? That, that's a big difference I see. And they wind up seeming somewhat top down in a weird way. Yeah, I think they're each different, and I, I'm not familiar with yeah. the, them individually, so I shouldn't say any more, really. But I, I think they, um, you know, offer a good, they, they fill a role. They could evolve into something that um, does bridge. I think a lot of these programs do need to bridge and um, bring together these constituencies. I, I did have a list of challenges, and one of them is that you're trying to bring together groups that may have different owners or, or you know, relationships politically, and that's going to, I think, be one of the challenges. If you're talking about you know, bridging appropriations or authorizations or, or different groups, that's a big challenge. And the innovation hubs, I think, are running into that, too. Uh, I think where they're similar is in scale, um, and see what you mentioned, they are really different. The one that I've taken a special look at is the one on nuclear operations, which is very focused on, on process. I mean, it's not about building new kinds of plants, it's about making current generation work better. And it does seem to have a pretty good industry participation, but they don't have skin in the game, so that's a big difference. Sunlight from fuels, you know, that's a blue sky kind of thing. So I just think they're, they're, they're very different from one another. And there may be some learning that could come from some of them, but I think I mean I think this huge difference that you know industry isn't driving the agenda that's that's an enormous you know, fundamental uh, disconnect. You might say it's a problem, but the DOE. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but that's just quick. It, it, anyway, it, 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 it's sort of there's not an industry there yet in a way. Yeah. I mean that, I think that is one of the differences that there's established industries that would be that are ready to go for an NNMI, whereas theory you're you're almost creating new yeah. technology. Also, I would add, it's, and in mind, it's probably more process focused, uh, not, not exclusively. Steve. That's what I was going to say to Celia David, and your comment was that the most successful models that we've seen are the ones that focus on both the pressing problems of today and the pressing problems of tomorrow. Because the pressing problems of today can capture membership in a way that's very practical, yeah. and then uh, you build then to the pressing problems of tomorrow. If you have one without the other, that's that's not uh, what a well-rounded uh, institute would be. Do you have an example of that? Sure. I would think. Uh, now I would go back to a little bit of a, a university center example. Uh, uh, in upstate New York, uh, the SUNY system, uh, State University of New York, is 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 naming uh, best practice centers of excellence. I happen to be geographically local to Binghamton University, which is actually the home of the IBM Corporation and local to one of our facilities. There's an electronic packaging center there that has focused for decades on the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow and always had a balanced portfolio. So while that's an academic example, same thing applies. And that's what kept the membership decades long in terms of uh, participation. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, great. Well, this was a, a, a really, I think, first of all, excellent report, David. And uh, Mike, did you have one last one? Yes. Uh, okay. Just, just have a comment. We have been overwhelmed with uh, the quality and energy of the inputs from the archives from the four uh, uh, innovation in input workshops. I wanted to call your attention as we announced uh, 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 last week that <coughs> the administration will be uh, announcing, uh, releasing the design of NNMI and holding uh, the first of, we hope, uh, a, a, a small handful of design review workshops. Uh, this is uh, January 16th, uh, hosted by our friends at DOD, but down at Mar uh, the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. But, uh, it will be our, our design review, and we'll have the, the actual specifics of the institutes and network uh, out in advance of that session. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Uh, so, um, please join me in thanking a wonderful panel who. Uh, <laughs>